That there is one of the strongest themes in my heart. I'm so glad that you shared that word. His heart's cry. We actually have a part to play in answering the prayer of Jesus. We partner with him. He wants us to be one. And when we behold him as we were during worship, as we do all the time, it's our choice, 24-7. As we behold him and him alone, and he is first, all of that other stuff, offense, anything else that would possibly distract can never get between us and him, ever. There's no room for any, any time we allow offense, any time we allow somebody to distract us, get us off, hurt us, and get our attention on them, we put them between us and the Lord, yeah. right? That's not my message, but that is, thank you for that word. Thank you for that word. I am back from sabbatical. It is so good to be back, you guys. Woo! I am so glad to be back. I've already cried off all my makeup. God won't let me wear makeup. He just like, every time I come prepared, he's like, no. No, I'm like, okay, all right, all right. And I'm taking my shoes off and everything else. He's like, naked and unashamed. That's how we made you, right? And so we come boldly, we come brave, and just all we want is him. The sabbatical was wonderful. We actually celebrated, my husband and I, 31 years of marriage. And th we were talking about 32 years ago when we were engaged. I remember one weekend, he came up to me, he goes, hey, let's spend the weekend hanging out. And I said, I'm so, so sorry. I just really, I really, 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 I need to be with Samuel. I know, that's what he did. He was like, crickets, right? What? We're engaged. Samuel who? I'm like, first and second. First and second Samuel, that's right. Now, I love my husband, but I love the word more. And he put that love for the word in me. Honestly, I told him that this morning. If it weren't for my husband and his passion for the word of God, I don't know that I ever would have pursued Jesus in the word as I have because of what he just, his first words to me, you know, what's your favorite scripture? And I'm like, all of them. <laughs> like, I like knew nothing, but I love, I love, love, love the word. And I literally did. I meant it. I, I spent the weekend with First and Second Samuel about 32 years ago, the first time I read through it. And I still can't, I still can't be with the Lord in his word in Samuel and not cry. It wrecks me. It wrecks me, the heart of God, the unconditional love of God and favor of God through David's life absolutely wrecks me. I see the types and shadows and I see them fulfilled in Christ and I see all of the pieces coming together and I'm like, who, who in here, is anybody here a filmmaker? Does anybody make films? Okay, if you know someone who makes films, you need to tell them to start making films about the Word of God, about all these stories that nobody is even talking about because every single genre of every film is in the Word of God better than anything you've ever seen on the screen. I mean every genre. I'm about to introduce you to someone, in fact, that you might or might not know. Who has never heard of Mephibosheth? Oh, you've all heard of him. Yeah? You got a friend named Mephibosheth? I'm talking about your friend. I'm not talking about your kids that you name Mephibosheth. Do you... Is anybody, honestly, can we be honest? Has anybody not heard of Mephibosheth? Maybe you all have. This is a really verse. Good, okay, a couple people. I'm about to introduce you to Mephibosheth. I love Mephibosheth. He's one of my favorite people, and I learned so much from him. We will all find ourselves in him. And, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to get through what I can. I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory, though. We're gonna go to 2 Samuel chapter four, and I just wanna briefly pray as we start. Lord, I know that you're already here, and we are so delighted to just pull up a chair at the table and sit with you. We're, de we're just excited, we're delighted to break bread, and we're excited to hear from the Spirit of God individually and corporately as a body what you have to say today. I'm yielded to you. I just ask you that you would open up my, 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 uh, my heart and just pour out and spill out everything that you've intended for today. Nothing more, nothing less. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. I'm going to give you a little backstory, but we're in 2 Samuel chapter 4, right? Okay, the Lord God was the king of Israel. For those of you who might not know, I never want to assume, everybody knows, right? The Lord God was ultimately the king over Israel. But Israel was demanding an earthly king. He, they wanted a king in the flesh. They wanted to follow a man. They wanted to know each other after the flesh, just like the nations around them. So God granted their request and gave them Saul. Meanwhile, David, a man after God's own heart, is off in the field. He's a literal nobody. Nobody knows David. He's off by himself. He is so enamored with the Lord, he's out singing love songs. 
He's just out in the field and he's tending the sheep. He's working. He's tending the sheep and he's, de he's defending them against predators. He's on guard, but it's, it's him and his God. It's him and his king, just the two of them out there. But he's after God's own heart and God has been, spent a lot of time with him. He's spent a lot of time with the Lord. Meanwhile, war breaks out and the Philistines and Saul and the Israelites are all fighting and there's a giant that's standing in the way. You guys know the story of David and Goliath. We're not gonna go into it. But David comes in to go and bring some refreshment to his brothers on the front line. Ultimately, he becomes the star of the show. He steals it all. He, he comes in and he is the hero. He takes down the giant because he knows his God and those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. But he's not there to do exploits. He's not looking for fame. He is simply being himself in the Lord with the king of kings and he's just not afraid. He's the youngest and he just comes on the, on the scene and takes over. Everybody is applauding him. Saul, the king, says, I want him on my team. Get him, bring him over here. But now he's wooed and won the hearts of all the people because battle after battle after battle, he just slaughters all of the enemy. Ultimately, wins favor and attention. He ends up getting Saul's daughter, Michael, as a wife and Saul's son, Jonathan, as his best friend and covenant partner. Now Saul's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Even though he's been tormented by demons and this boy comes in, all he has to do is play the guitar because he loves the Lord. Anointing destroys the yoke and Saul now is free, but now he's actually looking. You know what I'm talking about, Peter. Now he's looking at David as not a friend, but a foe and an enemy because he could come in and take the throne. Let me tell you something. David didn't want the kingdom. What? He wasn't after the kingdom. He was with the king. What kingdom? Okay, we'll just, we'll just pause there. We'll chew on that for just a moment, right? So, just so you know, Saul is after David, okay? Now, now David and Jonathan end up cutting covenant, a blood covenant that basically says, all that belongs to me belongs to you. Now, we are responsible to care for each other's family if anything happens to either of us. So they're indebted forever to each other. This is the king, Saul's son, Jonathan, and David, now his enemy, but they have cut a covenant and we, they, they love each other, they're best friends. They love each other, okay? So Saul continues to hunt David. David refuses to touch the Lord's anointed. Saul is king, God placed him in position. He's like, I'm not touching him. Every time he had the chance to take out his enemy that was coming after his own life, he said, absolutely not. I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Wanna hear the irony? He was already the Lord's anointed, David. You know why? Because the anointing left, the Spirit of God left Saul and came on David. You can read about it. Go back and please read about it. So good, so juicy, okay? But he's actually looking at, he's looking at King Saul. He said, I didn't place him there. I'm not touching the Lord's anointed. Saul turns around. He's trying to kill the Lord's anointed, who is David. David, meanwhile, he's staying away from him. But because he's coming against the Lord's anointed, ultimately what happens is the fulfillment of the purpose and plan of God, David is going to be king. God looked for a man after his own heart, takes David, puts him in position. Saul and his son Jonathan and the rest of his sons are taken out in battle on the same day. So I'm setting that up to say, enter Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, that they had been taken out, they were killed. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. See, he wasn't disabled at the beginning, but he was introduced by his handicap. It's interesting, before you know his name, you know he was lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Say that after me, Mephibosheth. Good job, say it 10 times, no don't. You're gonna, you're gonna say something you don't wanna say. It's a hard name to say. It's difficult, I'm telling you. Um, but I like it, it's fun. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, Mephib okay. Um, so what has happened here is he's five years old and Grandpa Saul and Dad Jonathan are taken out in battle. He's actually in line for the throne. And at the time, whenever there would be a war or a battle, ultimately, the, those who were coming in, the new regime, would wipe them out. You can't have a trace of the rest of the family there because they might come back knocking at the door for the throne at some time. So Mephibosheth is a threat, right? So the nurse picks him up, quickly runs because she believes, this nurse, you have to think about this, there is a covenant that she doesn't know about. She starts running because she has heard stories in the house 
King Saul, Grandpa Saul, bedtime stories with Grandpa Saul about evil David. He was never evil, but you have to think about this. He hated him, so Grandpa Saul is like after him. So the stories and the stories that he was hearing in there, Mephibosheth is like, oh, I'm afraid of that guy. He's gonna come in and take the kingdom. The nurse picks him up, starts running, drops him. Think about how hard of a drop it would be that he's lame after that point. He's actually handicapped. It wasn't his fault, but he was set up for success picked up, dropped, and they took off to go into hiding. The nurse had no idea because if she had known about the covenant that was cut between Jonathan and, and David, she would have actually picked up Mephibosheth and ran to David and said, you have to protect him. So because of a lie about the king, their hearts were jaded and they ran and fled. God is, I don't know about God and all the stuff going on in the world. I don't know about that. They say he's a good God, but what about the people over here starving and all the bad stuff over here? And we can believe a lie and run the wrong direction. All righty. So Mephibosheth ends up being dropped. He's hiding from a bad king who was out to harm him. No, but that's what he thought. Fast forward now. David is actually a king, and it's at least 12 years that passes so Mephibosheth starts growing up in a different place in hiding. 12 years, right? At least 12. So he's at least, what, 19? Wait, 5 and 12. 17 plus into 20s. And David's king. David is so saturated with the goodness of God and the kindness of God. Let's look at 2 Samuel 9, what he does as king. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Wait, for whose sake? because someone earned it, someone did something good. Does anybody do anything good for the king? Can I go and just repay him? Mm -mm. For someone who's not even alive right now, there's a covenant. Someone died, namely Jonathan, and the king is after the one he has covenant with to show anybody kindness in the lineage. Sounds like another covenant I know of. Jesus and the Father have cut a covenant that you can't change. You have nothing to do with it. God the Father wants to show you kindness because Jesus has a covenant with the Father that was unbreakable. And he died and he rose again so that covenant is intact regardless of your behavior. We have often believed a lie that we haven't done enough to earn. Well, we haven't. We never will. Or maybe we did too much wrong. Doesn't matter, actually. Not what we've done or haven't done at all. The covenant's cut, and it's being fulfilled, and we can enter in. So he wants to show kindness. Verse 2, now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? I don't know how to say his name. Ziba, Ziba, okay. Um, At your service, he replied. And the king said, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? He's not even talking about himself. He's like, I got, why? Because I have too much. I have too much. I have too much. I can't keep it to myself. How selfish would that be? I'm on overflow, right? El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, I'm with him. It's too much. Verse four, where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he's at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Verse five, so King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. Mephibosheth, the crippled prince, <laughs> He was found waiting in Lodabar, <laughs> wanting. He, he, he actually was not excited about being found, probably. You have to understand this. The whole time he's thought the king could be out to get him. He's in hiding. The word Lodabar actually means the place of no pasture. The word Dabar means word or thing. The lo is the negative, so no thing, no, no word, no pasture. Now, you know the king, David, Psalm 23, knows his good shepherd, makes him lie down in green pastures. <laughs> now he's going after the boy who's in no pasture to bring him in to feast. His intention, the king's intention toward us. 2 Samuel 9, verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, I don't know what he was going to do. He's lame. At your service? What does he have to offer? As much as me? As much as you? Nothing. 
Nothing. I have nothing. I am nothing, and I can do nothing without the king. There's no such thing as self-sufficiency in the kingdom. No such thing. The first thing out of David's mouth, the king, don't be afraid. Look at that, verse 7, don't be afraid. It was delivered in an instant. Perfect love casts out fear. Boom. Done. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Not because of you, for, you, for Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. You will always eat at my table. You got to think about this lie being dissolved in an instant. Mephibosheth is sitting there going, wait, aren't you the one who was after me to harm me? Wait a minute. What do you mean you're giving me back the kingdom? What do you mean all the stuff that belonged to grandpa and dad is mine? What do you mean? Wait, that's not what I expected. And now I'm going to eat at your table? <laughs> Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So in an instant, he has a staff of 35 waiting on him hand and foot, literally. <laughs> Taking care of everything. Everything he needs is now immediately taken care of. And Ziba says to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Went from being a complete, now this is all of us, right? You guys can see yourself. This is every single person. It had nothing to do with Mephibosheth. It has nothing to do with us. The goodness and kindness of God is running after us, looking for us. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. So he had to be in close proximity. And I'm about to tell you something here in case you forgot. He was lame in both feet. Oh, isn't it the third time? This is the third time that we see this. He's introduced, and, he, and we're reminded over and over and over that he's lame. Now, we could be like, really, leave him alone, man. Like, gosh, like, seriously, can we just, he's a person. Can we not talk about his, all that stuff? He's not the one being reminded. We are. We're the reader. This is written for us. Why do we need to know that he is lame? over and over and over in case we think that we can just get up and run on our own two feet without sitting at his. He's my legs, friends. He's my legs. And I honestly think there are people in here that have had some issues that have maybe kept you from running at the pace that you're called and created to run. And I believe there will be physical healing, but I don't believe it's because he simply wants to heal you from the outside. But the calm and undisturbed heart and mind are the life and health of the body. And when we receive this from his table, from his lips, from the king himself, it brings a nourishment, it brings a sustenance, and we have healing, which is the children's bread. All I'm bringing here today is a doggy bag. I'm being serious. I'm being serious, like I got packed so full, I'm like I can't possibly take anymore. I'm gonna bring some leftovers, break bread, I'll give you some. This isn't, this can heal you, but it won't make you whole. Only the king can make you whole. I don't mean to deviate, I'm not going to. Okay, we, I, I wanna stay in this word because I don't know that we really stop and look at the words and it's a lot of scripture, but I want you to have said, I have read the story of Mephibosheth, okay? So, we're reminded over and over that he's lame. Again, Mephibosheth was never called to be sent. Mm. We're fasting and we're praying and we're going, God, move, send me, here am I. Mephibosheth was not called to be sent. He was called to be seated. Come, Come and sit down. Oh, Jesus did not go, you, go, you, go. He said, follow me. Follow me, follow me. Jesus called his disciples to first be with him. 
so they would never be independent of him. We don't grow up into independence in the kingdom. Every single day I'm more aware that I, I am dependent on him alone. I have nothing. You guys, I don't, oh, I don't know why my spirit, I think that there's so much sometimes, not just striving to please him, but striving to do things that are important or what we think because we believe a lie is more important. I wanna do something more important. I got to serve with my king at his table in the parking lot last week. And you know how much fun that was? A blast. A blast. From the parking lot into the platform or whatever this is, a pulp, whatever this is. I, neither one's more important. Neither one is more important. What's important, him? What does he want today? What do you want today, Lord? Can I be a part of it, whatever it is? Wherever, wherever it is, whatever it is, please, that's fun. And he might just say, no, I want you to be. Oh, that's too easy. That's too easy. Make me work for it. Confessions of a workaholic, okay. <laughs> Hence my sabbatical for 30 days and why I'm just like, ah, because he's so good. Ah. He was never called to active service. He was called to active seating. He didn't come to the table with something to offer. This is not a potluck, people. He came with nothing. And we're reminded everything we have is a gift from God. It is his kindness to us. Everything. We're singing about it. You're my everything. He is. And if we have anything apart from him, it's nothing. The kingdom without the king is empty. Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2.8. We'll see what happened to Mephibosheth. You can pop there real quick. 1 Samuel 2.8. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. Listen to the New Testament parallel to what happened. And this happened with us, too, in him. Verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ together. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness. Sounds like David had a little bit of a, free glimpse into what that kindness was that God is longing to show us for by grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them but you never walk before you're seated right it's not by works ultimately we will have works we do but this isn't by works that we're here None of us. It's not worth it. So everybody lived happily ever after, after. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, no, why I say this is because that's where people end the story. I had never really heard about Mephibosheth when I was reading about him. And then later on I thought, I wonder if anybody talks about Mephibosheth. Why don't they? And I had read more and I'm like, certainly people would be talking about him if they're seeing this. But what happens is, is there's this whole gap in time. The devotion of the heart of Mephibosheth actually would end up being tested in the years and seasons to come. I'm not suggesting that we read between the lines, but you have to think about what took place at this time. He sat at the king's table always. When the kingdom went through turmoil, when the whole Bathsheba incident went down, when David's son raped his other daughter. Yeah, it's in the Bible. When two of his sons were after each other and one killed the other one, and then one rose up against the king. Kingdom in turmoil, wars in the fields, wars in the family, and the whole time Mephibosheth is there. It says that he's, that he's been at the table. What does that mean? It means that no matter what happened, nobody else, because of second information, was gonna come between him and the king. He wasn't out there somewhere and heard all this bad stuff going on. Oh, yeah, I knew that he was bad. Yeah. Mm -mm. Guess what? He was there just like the disciples were with Jesus when Jesus started talking about stuff they didn't understand. What? You're going to eat my body? 
You're gonna drink my blood? And, and half of them are like, I'm out of here. Freaky. And the other one said, I've come too far though. Why? Because I know you. I know your heart. Who else has the word of eternal life? What other table could I possibly go to? Mephibosheth is there. He knows the heart of his king even when he doesn't understand. So years pass, he's still there. Fast forward, David's son Absalom is assuming the kingship. David yields the kingdom with hands open. Please go read this part. I don't have time for this. But he's never, ever held on to the kingdom. Why? Because he never gave himself the kingdom. If we go scramble for something, we're going to try to hang on to it. Oh, I got to guard this. I got to keep this. The anointing never had to protect itself. I don't protect God. I'm with him. I'm in him. I'm nothing without him. He can do what, when, where, how. Why? I'm a yes all. And I love him. And you too. So what's going on here is David's son rises up. He loves his son to the point where he's like, please let nothing happen to Absalom, please. And yet he knows ultimately there's a battle. So David leaves so that his son can come in and take, just take the kingdom. I don't even need it. His heart is broken, but he's leaving. He's leaving Jerusalem. Let's check, check out what happens. 2 Samuel 16. When David had gone a short distance beyond the summit, there was Ziba, the steward of Mephibosheth, waiting to meet him. He had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 cakes of raisins, 100 cakes of figs, and a skin of wine. The king asked Ziba, why have you brought these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and the fruit are for the men to eat. The wine is to refresh those who become exhausted in the wilderness. Look what I've done for you. <laughs> Where did he get it? Probably from all the stuff that Mephibosheth inherited. Either way, we don't know. He's got a lot that he's bringing out there. So Ziba is standing before the king, has just unloaded all of this stuff on him, and the king says, where is your master's grandson? Who is that? Mephibosheth. David the king, sitting here with Ziba, who is his Mephibosheth's servant, says, where is Mephibosheth? As he's leaving Jerusalem. Ziba said to him, he's staying in Jerusalem because he thinks, today the Israelites will restore to me my grandfather's kingdom. Has anybody ever slandered you? Has anybody ever lied about you? This is where these, those offenses would get in. Maybe you, maybe you were out there, you've come to the king's table, but now people in the family have been lying about you to other leaders or things like that. Now your heart is a little bit distant. Just follow what happens here. I don't mean to go fast. Sorry, I get passionate and I kind of get there. But so he said, where's your master's grandson? Ziba said to him, he's staying in Jerusalem. Verse four, the king said to Ziba, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. He did a transference of wealth as king Still ruling, ultimately knowing he's king. Take everything I gave Mephibosheth. You take it. I humbly bow, Ziba said, may I find favor in your eyes, my lord the king. I have to fast forward again because a long time passes. Absalom, David's son, does a bunch of crazy stuff in the kingdom. You don't, you don't uh, it's disgusting and it's horrifying. But he does it and he's following some wrong advice. And then he comes against David, again out in the wilderness where he's hiding out there and his life ends up being taken. So David is stuck now. He's gotta go back in, not stuck, but he's gotta go back in and become king. Because people are going, you gotta get back into the throne. You gotta be, you're the king, go. Well, his heart is so broken. He said, I wish I died instead of my son. The one who was trying to take my life, I wish it was me. I wish I died, And he, because he died. <sighs> what kind of heart is that? What kind of heart is that? That's just unconditional love that never stops. You can't destroy it. You can't kill it. But David does come back. And on his way back into Jerusalem, this is where the story gets juicy. Because everything up to this point, Mephibosheth had nothing to do with. He was summoned. He was seated. Verse 24. 2 Samuel 19. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king as he's coming back. He had not taken care of his feet or trimmed his mustache or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? 
He said, my lord the king, since I your servant am lame, I said, I'll have my donkey saddled and I'll ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me and he slandered your servant to my lord the king. My lord the king is like an angel of God, so do whatever you wish. All my grandfather's descendants deserved nothing but death from my lord the king. But you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. So what right have I to do to make any more appeals to the king? And the king said to him, why say more? I order you and Ziba to divide the land. What is he ultimately saying? I gave it all to Mephibosheth. Ziba came in and he tried to serve me and I gave it all to him. And then, you know what? You guys split it. David's like, I don't care. It's stuff. Just take, just split it. You're up here trying to get your stuff. Okay, all right. He's probably over it. I could be wrong. He's a person too, right? Okay, David, yes, heart after God, but he's been through it. Verse 30 is the, is the clencher right here. Mephibosheth said to the king, let him take everything. Now that my lord, the king, has returned home safely. I don't want it. I didn't come out here to get anything. You're back. If you don't notice, I haven't even showered. I've not taken care of my feet. I've done, I, I, I shouldn't even be presentable. Nobody goes before the king without being completely ready to see the king. No one. And when he came in and he was seated at the table before, he was in fear for his life. And he came, they put him before the king when he first met him. Now guess what? He's not afraid for his life. He's coming in him completely disheveled, completely himself. He's like, I just want you. I just want you. I don't have any, I have nothing to prove. I already know I have nothing. You think I wanted the table? As soon as you left the table, it was not a meal anymore. Some people come into church week after week and they're pulling up to the table, but they're like, oh man, I've heard this. You know, who's preaching? Okay, what time is it? Oh, I just remembered I have this, my Mephibosheth bracelet on. It's, it's a key, but it says found. You guys know we didn't choose him, right? I didn't find God. I didn't choose him. He chose me. He chose you. You had nothing to do with it. We never give ourselves anything. We freely receive. It's a constant plate of gratitude, place of gratitude. That's all we have. Gratitude. Let him take everything now that my lord the king has returned home safely. Notice that the table without the king again wasn't enough for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth left the table and the kingdom to find the king. He knew he was coming back and he just was looking for him. The king's table without the king is empty. Ecclesiastes actually says this. Solomon says this. Who can eat or have any enjoyment apart from him? Who can eat or have any enjoyment apart from him? All the stuff in the world. Man, I remember right before I met the Lord, this was mulling in my heart like, I didn't know Jesus, but I was like, if I had everything I ever wanted, everything, and I started dreaming about all the stuff I wanted, I would look at myself, like kind of project forward and go, 30 years from now, would I even be happy? And honestly, I was like, no. That's why I ended up having a suicide pact with a friend of mine before I met the Lord. And thank God he found me. <laughs> But we're, this life without him, and not even knowing why we're here, is nothing, nothing, worthless, empty, void. Paul said it. Everything I had before, dung, excrement, manure, worthless. To what? The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. That's it, knowing him, right? Mephibosheth never lost sight of his first love. We're almost wrapping up here. His king always meant more than the kingdom. If we can have either Michelle or I don't know who's coming up here, but there was something that Mephibosheth had. He had his kingdom priorities straight. There was one king, and if this is something I want to just drive home for us to never forget, is the king is always over the kingdom. He always comes before the kingdom. He's always greater than the kingdom. One king, and he always is before the kingdom. One thing, this is where Mephibosheth had to get it. Think about this. He's sitting at his King David's table. And what did he know about David? As king, he never clung to anything except for his king. You have to know this. You have to know that he's sitting at the table. He knows the heart of this earthly king who didn't care about an earthly kingdom. 
never tried to keep it, never tried to fight for it, never tried to wrestle for it, just surrendered to his king every step of the way. So he had one king, and his king said one thing. Let's look at Psalm 27. The one thing is intimacy before activity or intimacy before ministry. The king before the kingdom, intimacy before ministry. Before finding out, we're going to jump back into the amazing series on the gifts and stuff, which is so important. We need to know how we function, how we're wired, how did God create us, what he's given so that we can use it and steward it well. But before we do any of that, the giver, not the gift, the giver. Psalm 27, 4, one thing, this is David the king, have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek, inquire for, and insistently require, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, in his presence all the days of my life, to behold and gaze upon the beauty, the sweet attractiveness, and the delightful loveliness of the Lord. I don't even think David wanted to come out of the field because he was already in the house of the Lord in the field when he was with the sheep as a kid. And then he comes into a palace and he's like, I just want your presence though. I just want, I don't know, you know? This is okay, but I just want you. Like nothing else satisfies, right? Ah, the beauty of the Lord. And meditate, consider, and inquire in his temple. I just want us to take a moment before we are taking this with us in our doggy bags today. <laughs> and I don't know if you're Mephibosheth this morning. Maybe you were dropped as a kid. Maybe you were hurt because somebody didn't understand the love of God and his intention towards you. I mean it. You might be carrying something around like I just never could get close because I didn't know if I could trust him. Maybe you grew up and you knew the Lord. You were at the table again and something came in. The fence got in there. Something got in that just keeps you from being so... Uh, that he's not your first love. By the way, there's no such thing as first things first any more than there is first loves first. First thing first. First love first. So if you find that that isn't as it needs to be, the king's not mad. He's just going, let me put you back here at the table. Let me, let me by the way, pull, your, pull you underneath, your legs underneath the table so that you're aware of your lameness, but it's not being seen, I'm covering that. I'm covering that up. Your shame, all that's gone. You have a seat at the table, always at the king's table. Rita Springer just released a song, really from the heart of the father. I don't even know what the title is because it just came out. I'm looking for it, but I know what it is. I know what it's about. And it's this, honestly, it goes so with this. I just wanted to, in case people are later on, where did that come from? It's from her. <sighs> it's my yoke is easy. So if you find yourself being Mephibosheth, if you find yourself being somebody who's been working for something that's given and it's free, if you find yourself as a David this morning, maybe you just live at the table. You live there all the time. Everything that comes out of your life comes from that overflow. And maybe you're like, who can I show kindness to, man? I've got it too good. I just can't keep this to myself. Take this time in your seat. Shut your eyes, no one else is in the room but you and the king at the table. And let him minister to you. Let these words saturate you. Just enjoy his presence because he wants to feed you and he can feed you so much better than anybody else can. You don't need to add to the meal. <laughs>